uh, we pray uh, that also you'll take time out and go to our YouTube channel, which is also, uh, that's the word, ministries, amen? And so we are ready. We have a power-packed uh, several verses here that we are going to uh, go through to here tonight. Uh, can be a little controversial a little bit uh, tonight, uh, but we will uh, we will speak uh, what the word says, amen? So get ready for the word. We'll be right back with that word and a word of prayer right after this. back. We are streaming right now live over Facebook, YouTube, Spreaker.com, Twitter, and Instagram. Amen. And so we once again invite you uh, to share out this page and others also may be blessed. And welcome to Twitter and welcome to Instagram. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we bless your name tonight. We thank you once again for giving us an opportunity to open up your word. Lord, as these words go forth, Lord, I pray that you will have your way. Speak to our hearts. Uh, as only your word can, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will have uh, your way, Lord Jesus. Lord, we don't want to hear from anyone or anything, Lord, but you. So, Lord, once again, have your way in this time in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you, my God bless you, my sister Sarah. Amen. And uh, we are ready to go. Amen. We are ready to go here. Amen. God bless, bless you, Tracy T. All right. Uh, we are going to pick up in Matthew chapter number 18, and we left off in chapter number, verse number 20, so we'll pick up here uh, in Matthew 18, starting in verse number 21, amen? Verse number 21. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him, till seven times? Now this is going to this uh, question that uh, Peter brings to Jesus is a question that's going to lead Jesus into the parable of the unforgiving ser servant that he is about to speak. Jesus makes this re reply uh, just before he speaks the parable in verse number 22. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Amen. 70 times 7. Let me see if I can fix that. Hold on one second with the sound. All right. Let me know if the sound is better. Let me know. Thank you. All right. So Jesus here, he tells him, do not say uh, until seven times, but until 70 times 7. 70 times 7. Now, that does not mean, if you do the math, that does not mean uh, that you forgive your brother uh, 490 times, and after that, uh, all bets are off. No. What Jesus is meaning here is that we are to forgive uh, one another ongoing. And how do you do this? How do you forgive? Amen. Thank you, Tracy T., how do you forgive someone continuously? Someone who has wronged you, someone who offends you, someone who does you wrong over and over again. How can you and I continue to forgive? What, what is Jesus' word on forgiveness? Well, he tells this parable here, starting in verse number 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his serv uh, of his service. He was checking the books. 
And when he had begun to reckon, uh, he one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now let me just say 10,000 talents. Uh, 10,000 talents. Uh, God bless you, Frank Gibson. God bless you. Uh, let me just tell you that 10,000 talents uh, is was an exorbitant amount of money in those days. Translated, that would equal anywhere from several millions to even up to billions of dollars in our uh, terms today. And so this was an amount that was exorbitant. This, this kind of money was not even in circulation uh, in these days that we're speaking of in, in Israel at that time. But once again, Jesus is making the parable. He's going to make a point here. And so here's this one servant that owed uh, his Lord uh, 10,000 uh, talents, okay? But it says, but for as much as he had not to pay. And here's, let me just tell you that the, the, the Lord here, uh, this Lord, uh, this one who is owed the money, uh, in parabolic terms, that's God. Once again, in parabolic terms here, he's talking about God. And this servant who owes this large amount of money, God bless you, Frank and Doris, God bless you. This, this servant who owes this large amount of money uh, pictures us. We owe a debt that we cannot pay. No matter what we try to do, we cannot pay what Jesus has done for us. This is why we praise him. This is why we worship him. This is why we love him. This is why we desire to serve him because he has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And that is something that we are going to be praising him for for eternity. And so there is nothing that we can do here on earth that can pay back what the Lord has done for for us. You've heard the saying, and it's so true. If the Lord never does anything else for you or I, he has done enough. And, and, and once again, that's why we praise him. But here in verse number 25, for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had uh, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. This is us. This is us. We, 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 we bow before him. Lord, I come to you. I bring myself to you. I, 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 I put myself on your mercy. Then the Lord of, the serv of that servant was moved, verse number 27, with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. This is a great, astounding, amazing act of grace on the part of this Lord, this one that was owed this amount of money. Once again, it is a picture it is a picture of what God has done for us through Christ. God bless you, Donna. God bless you, Kathleen. It is a picture of what God has done for us through Christ. Once again, we said that we cannot pay the debt that we owed. But here's what happened. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. And we did not deserve it, even while we were yet sinners, yet sinners, Christ died for us. This great act of grace meant that he loosed him from the debt. He canceled out the debt. This man no longer owed him this 10,000 talents. He, he, he didn't, it, it was gone. It was just, it was, it did not exist anymore. And that's what Jesus does to our sins. From the Old Testament, Scripture says that he takes our sins and hides them behind his back. From the Old Testament, it says that he casts our sea uh, into the depths of the ocean. In New Testament terms, he cleanses us, he washes us. 
uh, First John chapter one and verse uh, number nine. Amen, Frank. He 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 proved his love for us by dying for us while we were still sinners. And once again, our minds, your mind and my mind, we cannot really take that in. I mean, we read it, we understand it, we talk about it, we sing about it. But what Christ has done for us, once again, we are going to be blessing him throughout eternity. Verse number 28. But the same servant went out, and here's where Jesus is going to make the point about forgiveness. He forgave us so much. What should we in turn do? But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Now, a hundred pence compared to 10,000 talents. 10,000 10, talents, we said, was probably close to uh, maybe a billion dollars. But a uh, uh, hundred pence is anywhere, once again, anywhere from $10 to several hundred dollars. And so the, the difference between the two, once again, is a wide margin. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. Literally, he choked him. Took him by the throat. Pay me what thou owest. Pay me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Wow. Those words sound familiar? These are the same words. These are the same words that he spoke to that Lord that forgave him of those 10,000 talents. And he hears those words again. Verse number 30. And he would not. In other words, he wasn't having it. He wasn't hearing it. He didn't want to hear anybody say, have patience. He wanted his money and he wanted it now. But he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. He did not forgive. Okay? Unforgiveness. We have been forgiven so much, and yet we can't forgive others when they do us wrong. Nothing compared to the debt that was forgiven us, our sin, that would, plunge, would have plunged us into hell. And yet someone does us wrong, and there are different ways that we can be wronged and, and, and sinned against, but we cannot forgive? Mm. So when his fellow servants saw that was done, what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, verse number 32, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant. Now he is a wicked servant. He wasn't wicked before, but because of your unforgiveness, because of his unforgiveness, he was now Characterized as a wicked servant. I forgave thee all that debt because thou desires him, because you asked. Just because you asked, you pleaded. And I forgave you that debt. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Once again, since God has forgiven us so much, we should forgive others when we are wronged. Once again, it's easy to say. And I'm not, I'm not trying to soft soap it or try to make uh, forgiveness sound like such an easy thing. But I'm just telling you what scripture says. When someone does us wrong, and this does happen, all of us have been wronged in this life in one way or another, I am sure. We are to forgive. We can't carry around unforgiveness. Unforgiveness not only, not only will affect you, but it will affect others. Scripture talks about a root of bitterness that can grow from unforgiveness. And so we need to let things go. Once again, that phrase, let it go, uh, I'm not trying to minimize, once again, uh, forgiveness, but we need to not allow what others do to us to cause us to become the people or the person that God does not want us to be. Amen? Verse number 34. And his Lord was wroth, angry, and delivered him to the tormentors. 
Amen. Uh, Dawn, we are in chapter number 18. We are in chapter number 18, and we are in verse number 34, Matthew 18, 34, Dawn. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. Amen. Uh, once again, tormentors, the jailer. That, that word tormentor is, means jailer, the jailer. So likewise, likewise, my heavenly father, shall my heavenly father do also unto you, speaking of us, if ye from your hearts, from your hearts, forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Let me go quickly uh, to Ephesians, uh, the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter number four. And verse number 30, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30, verse number uh, 32, I'm sorry, let me start at verse number 31, Ephesians 4 and verse number 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's the word on forgiveness. We are to forgive others when we are wronged. Seventy times seven. It doesn't stop. We are to forgive. Whether, and now here, here it comes. Here's the point of contention. Whether the individual is repentant or not. Now it comes a point, of course, on our side. Uh, what does Scripture say? Uh, we are to live peaceably with all men, as much as it lies with us. We are to be at peace with all men, and so we must. We must make sure that we don't allow ourselves uh, to be the brunt of this type of behavior. Okay, so once again, it, it doesn't mean being. Uh, forgiving everyone, and yes, Frank, it, it is a tall order, uh, but forgiving one another uh, does not mean that we are to be doormats and just allow people to do whatever they want, say whatever they want, and behave any way they want because we are the Christian and we're just going to forgive whatever. Don't put yourself in a position, okay, to, as much as it lies with you, don't put yourself in a position to be uh, to be the one that has to constantly uh, be on the forgiving end if it's not necessary. But once again, Christ has forgiven us so much, we ought to forgive others much less than what Christ forgave us in the long run. Amen. All righty, we're going to go to verse number, chapter number 19. Chapter number 19, the book of Matthew, chapter number 19. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. Amen. Yes, Donna, it is hard. But what we just spoke about, it is doable. It's hard. It's difficult. It's a tall order. But it is doable because once again, we have the spirit of the Lord in us and he will work with us, he will enable us, he will empower us to do the things that we need to do when we need to do them, amen? Verse number two, 19, verse number two, and great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. Don't get past that little freight. And he healed them there, there, where they were. Jesus Jesus healed people right where they were, okay? He, he Sometimes there were, there were occasions in Jesus' ministry where he would have to take a person to the side, amen, where he would have to take a person aside and, and heal them. Jesus would do that at, at times. But notice what it says, that it says that uh, he they followed him and he healed them there where they were, amen, amen. I can do all things through Christ, amen. Verse number three, the Pharisees also came unto him tempting him anytime we've been going through the book of Matthew and what we have seen anytime the Pharisees show up they mean 
to have a problem with Jesus. They already have a problem with Jesus, but get ready because something is about to take place, okay? And whenever Jesus is in the presence of the Pharisees, uh, he usually ends up chiding them, correcting them, and it's a teaching point for us at the same time. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, testing him, trying him, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Is it lawful? So they asked this question because certain Pharisees, certain Pharisees of Jesus' day, uh, there were Pharisees who had been under uh, the great uh, Jewish rabbi Hillel. And Hillel came out with some very outlandish and liberal thought on marriage. And one of the things that Hillel taught about marriage was that a man uh, could uh, divorce his wife for any trivial reason whatsoever. And when I say any trivial reason whatsoever, that's exactly what I mean. If you were under the great Hillel and you were a Pharisee, you believed that you could divorce your wife for such things as burning the food. And I even read, I even read where it was it was lawful for the Pharisee uh, to divorce his wife. I'm not meaning to make this out of a joke, but here is what Hillel spoke. You could divorce your wife for having bushy eyebrows. Okay, and so once again, it, it just shows how people added to the law. Okay, of course, this is ridiculous. You, you don't divorce someone for such reasons. But once again, liberal thought of the day, they came with that. So they come with this question. Uh, is it lawful, is it right for a man to put away his wife for every cause or for anything? Verse number four. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Let's stop there at verse number four. Verse number four, uh, verse number four answers four questions, uh, two questions right away. It, it, it shuts down two uh, trains of thought immediately. Number one, the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God, he made them male and female. Two, it shuts down a same-sex marriage. Shuts it down. He created them male and female. Not male and male, not female and female. And you know you know the old saying, God created uh, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And, and it, it's very true. It's very true. <clears throat> same-sex marriage. Unlawful, unlawful, okay? It is an abomination in the sight of God, amen? Verse number five, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. He's asking the question, don't you know these things? The two shall be one flesh? Are you not aware of this? And he continues in verse number six, Wherefore, they are no more twain or two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. That word asunder means don't let man uh, separate. Don't let man uh, uh, put away. Okay? Once again, when you go to the book of Malachi, uh, Malachi uh, chapter number two, Malachi chapter number two and verse number 16 uh, makes an astounding statement that I don't know uh, how many are aware of, but let's go to Malachi uh, chapter number two, uh, starting in verse uh, number and read verse number 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel saith that he hateth putting away. He hateth putting away. Translate it. God hates divorce. That's exactly what that means. 
God hates divorce. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord uh, of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Once again, this whole idea of treating your wife uh, badly because she doesn't meet up to your expectations uh, was beginning to emerge here at the in the book of Matthew. It was beginning to emerge. Once again, Matt Malachi is the last book written in the Old Testament uh, before we have the 400 years of silence. Uh, and so this thought was coming into play uh, but it had not it had not taken a grip yet, and so God was already telling them, "I hate divorce. You you can't treat your wife treacherously. You can't you can't uh, you can't cover yourself up by uh, treating your wife this way. This is not good." Amen. Frank says that salvation we are forgiven. I feel we are motivated to forgive others because the Lord forgave those while He was hanging on the cross. That's that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Uh, Jesus forgave that uh, thief on the cross as he was dying. And once again, Christ is our, our, our example, and we should follow suit and forgive others when we are also uh, wronged. Now, he says here in verse number seven, they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? And once again, Jesus is going to explain this. We already said that God hates divorce from the book of Malachi. And they were these were the Pharisees. They knew. They knew very well uh, what Scripture said. They said, uh, Jesus says, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered or allowed you to put away your wives. People are going to do what they desire to do. And God and Jesus tells them this came into play. A divorce was allowed because of the hardness of your hearts. You're going to do it anyway. But from the beginning, it was not so. That's not so. That's That was not how it was at the beginning. And now Jesus is going to, to teach, speak, on divorce and remarriage. A sensitive subject for many. Verse number nine. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit Adultery. Now, understand what that says. Jesus says that if you, if a man puts away or divorces his wife, except for the cause of fornication, uh, marital infidelity, uh, it says, and marries someone else, that's adultery. In other words, uh, Scripture says here that only by fornication is a marriage to be dissolved, can be dissolved. Once again, God still hates divorce. He wants reconciliation if it is at all possible. But if there is marital infidelity within the marriage, there can be divorce, okay? There can be divorce. But if that's not the case, according to scripture here, if the divorce happens for some other reason, and we know that divorce happens for a lot of different reasons. If it's not because of uh, adultery, then uh, it says, if you marry someone else, that's adultery. That's adultery. The only biblical stipula stipulation for divorce is fornication, or once again, marital infidelity. And whoso marries her which is put away commits adultery. And so once again, Jesus is very, very straightforward. His disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. Basically, they come, they come to the conclusion, what's the point? <laughs> if this is what it is, if that's what it's all about, then, then why get married at all? But Jesus, Jesus reminds them, okay, he says, all men cannot receive the same, 
save they to whom it is given. And remember what scripture says uh, in um, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 22. It says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Amen. 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 So once again, God does not look down upon marriage. Marriage, marriage is, a, is a good thing. Marriage is a good thing. But once again, he says, all men cannot receive this saying, what he spoke about uh, in verse number nine. And all men cannot receive it, uh, save they to whom it is given. And by that, uh, he is talking about those that have a gift. The gift. Amen. Okay. Uh, we have a question. It says here, how about if an unbeliever leaves the marriage? Yes. And we are going to, that's exactly what we are going to tackle in just a few moments. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, uh, it speaks about, <clears throat> it speaks about those who have a gift or the gift. And that gift that he is speaking about there, let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 7. It says, For I would that all men were even as I myself. That's Paul speaking. But every man has his proper gift of God, one after this manner and one after another. And the gift that I'm speaking of is the gift of, and you want, once again, this is this is the only reference that you see to it uh, that in in, the, in my understanding in Scripture he's talking about being unmarried or single. Singleness is 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 a gift. It, he goes further and later on in chapter number seven uh, he speaks about uh, those who are single. Let me go to chapter seven and verse number thirty two. Uh, but I it says. Um, but I would have you, and I'm in, uh, once again, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 32. But I would have you without carefulness that is, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of, are of the world, how he may please his wife. So once again, he says, it's good if you can stay single. If you have the gift of singleness, it's a gift. Because once again, you are a man and you may have, you have sexual needs, but if God has been, uh, if God is able to gift you, if you have, if you are graced and gifted by God to be able to keep yourself intact, okay, biblically and be unmarried, then stay unmarried, okay? There's no stipulation that says you must be married. That you have to be married. It's a law that says that if you don't get married, you're sinning. No. If you are able to be unmarried, fine. Paul says uh, in his writings, he says, if you are married, stay married. If you're unmarried, don't seek a wife or a husband. Paul says this in, in, in these verses. So once again, there's nothing wrong with marriage at all. Marriage is, is, is good. It is good. Uh, and if you're in, stay. If you're not, stay. But if you need to be married, then the Lord will direct you uh, as to how you should uh, proceed uh, in finding a mate. Amen. So once again, that's very important uh, to remember. Uh, and that's in verse number, that's in uh, verse number seven, uh, verse number seven, I went to 32. Let's go back to Matthew. We're going to jump back into first Corinthians in just a moment, but I want to read verse number 12 first. Verse number 12, Matthew 19, 12. For there are some eunuchs which were born, which was which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. And that's what we were just reading now. When we talk about a eunuch, a eunuch is someone who has been a male who has been uh, castrated. Uh, it is also speaking of a male who is uh, impotent. And by extension, it also refers to a man who is unmarried. And in the case in verse number 12, someone who is, who is unmarried deliberately, who deliberately remains unmarried so that he can be closer to God, so he can serve God better, as we read 
in uh, chapter in First Corinthians chapter seven and verse number thirty-three. Amen. Once again, those people exist, male and female. He goes on after verse number thirty-three and talks about the woman who same thing that it's a gift. If you are able to be single, then be single. If not, please be married. Amen. Now, if we go back uh, to First Corinthians chapter number seven. And we go to verse number 10. Verse number 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 10. To get the, the final word on divorce and remarriage. Because Paul, uh, Jesus' teaching on uh, divorce and remarriage and Paul's teaching on divorce, divorce and remarriage uh, do, not, uh, do not go against one another. They, they complement one another. They, are, they do not contradict one another at all. Amen? Jesus didn't give us Everything we needed to know, Paul sort of completes it. Once again, it's by the Holy Spirit. The Word was written by the Spirit, and and the Spirit of God puts the final uh, puts the final notch on this whole subject here, uh, beginning at verse number ten. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Okay, but if she depart, if she depart, if the woman departs. Uh, if the woman, if the woman, let, verse number 11, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. Now, why does it say, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried? Because the conclusion is that she has departed not for reasons of fornication. She departed on her own for whatever other reason, whatever other reason that there may be. She's departed for that reason. And if that be the case, if it's not for fornication, that Jesus said uh, she should remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. Don't divorce your wife, okay? But the rest Speak I, not the Lord. And, and Paul makes a statement later that he, he believes he has the Spirit of God also. So don't be put off by the fact that this is Paul speaking and this is not God speaking. No, this is the Holy Spirit speaking. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believes not, and now he's talking about mixed marriages, those who, those who maybe two people came into the marriage uh, unsaved and one uh, one gets saved uh, as both of them are married. What do you do? And and this is what these next few verses are talking about. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife that believes not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Okay, let him not put her away. If one if one becomes born again in the marriage, uh, the one who is unsaved, if they want to stay with the saved one because Maybe the unsaved one will say, you're not the same person anymore, and they don't want to stay. But if they are willing to stay with you as now a Christian, there should not be a problem. And the woman, which has a husband that believes not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So once again, you now have what, what is known as a, uh, a, quote, mixed marriage. Mixed meaning one is a believer and one is not. Amen? Now, what we know that we shouldn't do, we shouldn't we should not go into a marriage in this state. In other words, you can only marry in the Lord. Uh, here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 39. I know we got a lot of scripture here tonight on this subject. Verse uh 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 39. It says, The wife is bound to by the law, as long as her husband lives. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So once again, we ought not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And this is also talking about marriage, okay? The marriage covenant. We ought to be, as a Christian, I should marry a Christian, okay? As a Christian, I cannot, I ought not to marry someone who is not a Christian with the hopes that I'm going to, they're going to become a Christian after we're married. Don't count on it. It can happen, of course, but we are told in scripture 
not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's that's the Bible way, amen? If we want to do it according to the Bible, we don't enter into uh, marriage relationships uh, with those who are unsaved. And we know courting, in other words, even if you're courting someone who is not a Christian, uh, that also is an unequally yoked relationship. If, it, if you see it going further, uh, you need to make sure, once again, both parties need to be saved, born again, amen? If you're a Christian, you want another Christian, amen? So that's, that's Bible. Okay, verse number 13, verse number 13, and verse number 14, I'm sorry. Yes, verse number 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Now, that what that simply means is there is a covering that happens. Uh, even if you, even if there is a marriage where one is saved and one is not, that one who is unsaved is now covered uh, in a sanctifying way. No, they're not saved. But once again, because of you in the house, because of that saved one that's in the house, that whole house, that's why it's talking about the children are holy. The children, that means sanctified. It doesn't mean holy in the sense of saved. It means holy in the sense of separated and sanctified. You are the covering in that house if you are born again and no one else is. You are that covering. Okay? You get When you get blessed, the family gets blessed. When you are protected, everyone is protected. Amen? And so once again, that's what that particular verse means. Now, here's verse number 15, which is a very controversial verse for many, but here's what it says. But if the unbelieving depart, and so you have the mixed marriage between the, the one that is saved and the one that is unsaved. If the unbelieving depart, the one who is unsaved, if they want to leave, I don't want to be married to you anymore because you're a Christian and I can't, you know, I can't deal with all. If they want to leave for that reason, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. Okay? But God has called us to peace, to be at peace. So, let me give you this final stipulation on divorce and remarriage and, and how we are to carry oneself in our marriages. Scripture says here, Scripture seems to say here, seems to imply here in verse number 15, that if you have two people who are married, and one is a Christian, and one is definitely not a Christian, and the one who is definitely not a Christian definitely does not want to live with or be married to the Christian anymore, their, their spouse. That is something that can take place. Once again, God still hates divorce. But once again, that person who is a Christian and you give that unsaved one, okay, if you want a divorce, you can have it. And now they are separated. They are no longer married. The unsaved, the, rather the saved one, the unsaved one's going to go on with their life and do whatever they want to do. But the saved one is now not under bondage. They're not under that same stipulation that we said before that if they have they have to stay uh, unmarried until their spouse dies because they have not done anything wrong. They did not commit adult. They did not do anything wrong to be divorced. The unsaved one just said, "I want a divorce." That spouse, who is now single can now be married. And as we read in verse number 39, only in the Lord. Only in the Lord. And so once again, there's a lot going on in these verses, but once again, that's what scripture says. Once again, God has called us to peace. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. The marriage bond has been has been broken. Okay? And they are not under bondage anymore. And they can proceed with their life. Okay? The unsaved one has gone to do whatever they do. The saved one now continues to live and work for the Lord. They can stay single for the rest of their life. Or if the Lord brings another person into their life who is born again, 
then that is something that can possibly take place. All right? All righty. Wow. Amen. Well, that's that's what Scripture says. That's what Scripture says concerning divorce and remarriage and all such things. Amen? Verse number, I'm back in Matthew chapter number uh, 19. I'm back in Matthew chapter number 19. Let's finish up these next few verses. Uh, let's start in verse number 13. Let's start in verse number 13. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. The disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, but Jesus said, suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. Remember we said last week uh, that uh, Jesus told them, everyone, we must become as little children if we are going uh, to be born again. Uh, anyone who comes into the kingdom uh, must uh, be born again. Uh, Frank says, thank you for that explanation. I was saved in rehab and my wife uh, gave me divorce papers in the rehab. Praise the Lord, I never went back to that way of life back in 2001. Amen. Amen. There you have it. There you have it. God is good. God is good. Amen. God is in control. God wants us to be at peace. Reconciliation, if it's possible. If it's not possible, God wants us to be at peace. Amen. So you have carried yourself, you have carried yourself properly. Amen. Thank you, my brother, for that. Verse, uh, verse number 16. Matthew 19, verse number 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good that but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, once again, there are many times that Jesus spoke Jesus called himself many times the son of man. And here he is, he is referring to himself in his humanness when he refers to God as no one is good but God. We know Jesus is good all the time. We know God is good all the time, amen? But once again, he is deferring, he is deferring to his father here. None good but God, amen? Uh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't understand this, that whole, uh, this whole subject completely, just as we don't understand this subject, uh, completely as it should be. Uh, but that is what is going on in that verse. And he said unto him, verse 18, which, which says, Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness, uh, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, G what Jesus did know is that none of these things will bring a man into the kingdom of God. None of those things. Once again, law. There is no there is no stipulation in the law that will that will save you. That will bring you to heaven. In other words, you can't go to heaven by keeping the 10 commandments. If it were possible that you would never break one in word, deed, or thought, that there is nothing in the law that would bring you to heaven. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came. The law was put in place as a schoolmaster, as a tutor to lead us to Christ, to show us that we are incapable of keeping the law. Scripture says the law was good. The law is perfect. God made the law. But once again, in his wisdom, he did not put anything in that law to help those to keep it. He just put it there. Here's the law. Do it. Can't be done. Can't be done. That was the that was the purpose for it. Amen. That was the purpose for it. Just to show the people uh where God was in his mind, understanding his morality, the things thou shalt not, thou shalt not, and all the other laws and all the other things that were put in place and the different uh, feasts, all these things led to Christ. All of these things led to Christ, amen? Uh, but this was, they were blinded by all of this when Jesus actually came. They didn't realize uh, that their Messiah 
was actually among them. Law cannot save. Amen. Law cannot save. Verse number 20. The young man saith unto him, all these things I have kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Hey, I've, I'm the man. I've done all these things. I'm good. So what else? What else do I have to do? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, if you want to do right, if you want to do right, he says, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. You want to be perfect? You, you, you want to be complete? Sell what you have. You see, you see, Jesus, Jesus knew the barrier that was keeping that young man from himself. Jesus knew that it was his riches. Because it says here, the young man, in verse number 22, the young man heard, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He had great possessions. You see, this is not, uh, this is not, Jesus not speaking against riches. He's going to go on and speak about that here in a moment. Uh, he's not speaking about riches. Let me conclude this and then we'll be finished with our study for tonight. He said in verse number 23, but Jesus, then said Jesus unto his disciples, verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven the kingdom of heaven. When his disciples heard it, they were exceeding amazed, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now, here's what Jesus means. It is not wrong to be rich. If the Lord has blessed you with material things, if he has blessed you monetarily, God bless you, amen? Uh, you are to be a good steward of what God has given you, but God bless you. Uh, and so this is not a case of God saying, if you're rich, you, you're not going to get to heaven. It, it can be it can be a barrier, as it was to this young man. This young man was unwilling to let go his stuff, his things. And that is what would keep this young man, we don't know whatever happened to him, but his things, his stuff, would be the thing that would keep him out of heaven. Now we know the we know the main reason why people don't go to heaven is not because of what they do or what they have. The reason why people don't go to heaven is because they don't believe. That's the reason why. And his stuff had him bound in such a way he wasn't ready to depart from them. And it would cost him, and hopefully it would, did not cost him uh, his eternity. Amen? And so there is there is something within each and every one of us. If we are not careful, a golden calf can arise in our life. An idol. Something that we put our faith in other than Christ. And that thing that's in our life that keeps us from being and doing all that we can be in Christ can be the difference between a satisfying, fulfilling life in Christ and a life of mediocrity in Christ. And we don't want a life of mediocrity in Christ. We want all that the Lord has. So in order to receive all that the Lord has, we have to let go the things that we have, those things that can bind us and hold us. That is what is important. Amen. Amen, Frank. Blessed uh, are those uh, who have not seen uh, but believe. Amen. The law, as Donna says, the law points the way to Jesus. Self-will cannot keep the law. Amen and amen and amen. On that note, we are going to pray. And uh, listen, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. It's always... I'm always uh, amazed and astounded uh, that you would come and, and, and hear the word of God here. Amen. 
But let's pray. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you once again for giving us uh, an opportunity uh, to, to open your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, we are we are astounded. We are amazed, Lord Jesus, uh, uh, that you would give us the opportunity uh, to do so. But Lord, we pray that uh, while you allow us to do so, uh, Lord, we pray that you will continue to draw souls unto yourself, Lord Jesus. Uh, Lord, we are just, uh, we're, we're not much, we're, we're, we are, we're nobodies. I'm a nobody, Lord Jesus. I'm just trying to tell folks about Jesus. And so, Lord, we just pray that you will have uh, your way, Lord Jesus. Bless us together as we continue in your word. Lord, we know that we've said some difficult things uh, from your word today, Lord Jesus, uh, concerning forgiveness and unforgiveness and divorce and remarriage and such things. Uh, but, Lord, we know that it's your word. Lord, help us to be faithful uh, to your word, even if we don't understand, even if we don't uh, believe, but, Lord, let us receive it. So, Lord, have your way. Bless each and every one under the sound of your word right here, right now, tonight. We bless you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Frank. God bless you, Frank and um, and Donna. And uh, we thank you, Tracy T. Amen. Uh, God bless you. Ricky Allen, God bless you, man. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. We just bless the Lord and we thank him for what he is doing. Amen. God is good. God is moving. And God is on the throne. Amen. God is on the throne. We honor him and we bless him. Uh, and we just thank him for all that he's doing. Now, if you're able, if you're able to be with us throughout the week, we have a week of online ministry. Uh, we began, we begin on Sunday, uh, Sunday morning, sometime Sunday afternoon with the Sunday, with the Sunday sermon series. Uh, the Sunday sermon series, uh, uh, is uh, every Sunday, uh, either at 11.30 or maybe around 4 o'clock. Uh, it comes live, uh, and we pray that you will continue to be with us. Our series uh, on Sunday, we've just begun last week, uh, is Just More of Him. Just More of Him. Amen? And so we pray that you're able to uh, come with us uh, as we go through the Word of God, speaking about uh, the relentless pursuit of, of God that we as God's people need to have. Amen. Also here on Monday night, of course, we are here with the, with the cutting, with the line by line podcast tomorrow night, tomorrow night, it, it'll be the Bible speaks live uh, podcast. We'll be here at eight o'clock and our topic tomorrow night, our hot topic tomorrow night uh, is the long arm of unbelief, the long arm of of unbelief. Did you know, and I'm sure you do know, that unbelief, unbelief has a devastating effect on saved people and, of course, unsaved people. We're going to be talking about uh, these devastating effects of unbelief. Amen. Uh, that's tomorrow night. Uh, please join us if you can at eight o'clock. Amen. And uh, we will unpack uh, this uh, powerful uh, time. Uh, in the word. Amen. Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday night on the, on the cutting it right Bible study, first principles of the Christian life. Uh, we are going to begin, uh, several lessons on confession and repentance, confession and repentance. What's the difference between confession and repentance and and what is repentance from from good works and and we're going to be talking run, run the whole gamut of confession and repentance in the next couple of weeks amen so so hope you can join us uh wednesday night that's starting at eight o'clock right here on facebook youtube spreaker.com twitter and instagram i pray that you'll be able to join us amen also don't forget that you can pick up our our book uh churchified or sanctified uh, exploring the differences, uh, exploring the difference between exploring uh, the dangers of religion and the glory of relationship. It is available on Amazon.com. Uh, and once again, I believe that it will be a blessing to your heart and life. That is churchified or uh, sanctified. Amen. And you can listen to all of our podcasts if you like to download. Uh, our main podcast platform is Spreaker.com. You go there and you'll see the other podcast that the Lord has enabled us to produce uh, over the years. Amen. And we just bless the Lord and thank him for all that he is doing. Amen. And so once again, we've come to the end of another uh, powerful 
uh, Bible study. We pray that uh, something that was said uh, tonight uh, will be beneficial to your heart and life, something that you can take with you uh, wherever you go. Uh, we pray that you'll continue to be blessed. And if I didn't say God bless you, Dawn, God bless you, Dawn. Amen. I didn't. Uh, God bless you again, Dawn. Thank you for being here. Amen. And so this is me, Michael Jakes, and uh, I thank you for being with us. And we're going to be back here again, as I said, tomorrow night, 8 o'clock, the perils uh, and talk about the long arm of unbelief. That's 8 o'clock tomorrow night. Join us if you can. We'll see you. Have a good night and God bless you.